Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. All right, welcome, uh, Matt DeVoe, the CEO of Uda, and this is a Udacast with Jer Thorpe. Uh, Jer is an artist, writer, teacher living in New York City, uh, best known for designing the algorithm to place the nearly 3,000 names on the 9-11 memorial in Manhattan was the New York Times first data artist in residence, a National Geographic Explorer, and in 2017 and 18 served as the innovator in residence at the Library of Congress. Uh, we'll link to the full bio before, I've only read the first paragraph, it's very extensive, but what caught my attention was this book that he wrote uh, called Living in Data, uh, which really for me, you know, people that watch the, uh, the podcast know I'm an avid reader, read over 100 books a year, uh, and it's rare for something to stick with me like this book has stuck with me. I keep bringing it up in conversations, I keep recommending it, I've already announced that it'll be one of my top 10 picks of the year. Um, and I think what really attracted me to it is I've read a lot of books about data science, but this is really kind of the human view of data science, but even more so, given my hacker heritage, you know, my interpretation of Jared's work was that he's kind of a, a data hacker that he's looking at the totality of the data and the systems that they exist with and asking the hard questions or looking at ways to construct the, you know, the way that we use data in a way that is better for society. So with that, Jer, welcome to the Udacast. Very happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really nice to be having this conversation. And uh, I don't know, maybe you should just expand your, your list to 11 so that you're <laughs> you, you you have a little more space. I don't I don't mind being on the list, but <laughs> yeah, it's a it's actually the most popular blog post I produce every year, which I guess is saying something. I get you know an avid uh, group of folks that like to see what what made the top ten list. But hey, I'd love to hear your origin story. Can you just kind of step us through the progression of your career and some of the interesting things that you've done? Sure. Um, so I I'm Canadian. I grew I grew up outside of Vancouver. Um, in, a, in a suburb called Tawasan. And if you went to my basement in 1985, when I was 10, you would have found uh, two floor looms, a pretty brand new Mac computer, and a, a box of punch cards that my, my dad brought home from his job at IBM that we would, we would have used as kind of scrap paper. And I think... <laughs> Like those three things kind of tell the whole story. Yeah, it, you know, my, my mom is a textile artist and my father, um, he started off as a programmer. Um, he's more on the kind of uh, thinking side of things um, now, but it's not a surprise, I guess, that I ended up somewhere in between those two things as, a, as an artist who uses tech. Um, I tried to avoid the computer business for a really long time. I, uh, I, I sort of promised myself as a as a teenager that I wouldn't wouldn't get into computers just because like I was already nerdy enough and like the last thing I needed was to be like the nerdy computer guy. So I kind of kept I kind of kept that hidden in some ways. And I, I went to school and I studied cell biology and genetics, um, and really purposely kept away from um, from from programming and and from computers until well, until I dropped out of school and and uh, and it, and at some point. One of my friends was kind of on the on ramp in the in the night the first kind of dot com boom at the end of the 1990s and I thought okay well let's get a job and uh, at that point they would kind of hire anybody who who could type on a keyboard <laughs> so they were looking for um, flash programmers and and I didn't know what flash was so at first I went and found out what flash was and then I spent a weekend just kind of hacking at it um, and. And put together a um, a resume that over exaggerated my ability to do anything, and I got hired as their lead flash the lead flash developer at this company. <laughs> and so I would go to to work, um, you know, all day every day, uh, just kind of nodding my head and saying yes, of course we'll do that. And then I would go home and furiously try to learn learn how I how to do the thing that I had said that I knew how to do in the morning. So you know that was that was my entry into um into this as a kind of job and but but this is i think where where we can circle back to those early days of of 
being connected to the arts is that the way that I would learn how to do these things was, was never about like thinking about how to do the practical thing. Like how do I build a drop down menu or like whatever that might be. I would like, oh, let's see if I could build a tree or, or, you know, build some strange organisms that follow each other around the screen. Um, and, and, and that, that, you know, that was kind of the flavor of those days. If people of a certain age will remember the flash experiments pages. And so I had a flash experiments page and, and, and eventually, you know, eventually found, uh, got really, really tired for a lot of reasons about, about the business side uh, of technology and, and just kind of made the decision that I would start working on the weird stuff instead. And that was a good decision. Because there's like a lot of people who do normal things, but not that many people who do weird things. So, so if somebody has a weird idea, like their pool of people to choose from is smaller than if they were like, I have a normal idea. So, so kind of against um, what I expected, what happened, I kind of started to get more work and weirder work, which was great. And then when I moved to New York in, in 2010, uh, I had met Nick Bilton at the New York Times and there was an opening for for somebody to come in and work on a project and he's like oh i know this guy who does weird stuff because it was a weird project and that that's how i ended up at the times and then the the rest of that history is really in the 300 pages of the book and and you know what i what i try to bring people through in in that book is how my thoughts changed about first of all what data is and then what are the things that we, we should be doing with it? And, and maybe most importantly, like who's welcome to do things with it and whose voices are, are sort of able to get into the room when we're talking about data. Excellent. It, it seemed to kind of also have focused on kind of data in the field. I don't know if it's a thought that crossed my head or I read it somewhere else and it's stuck mm. kind of describing as the Indiana Jones of data. Uh, can you... <laughs> Can you discuss uh, kind of the the allure of kind of the field research yeah. and the kind of the, yeah. the obscure field data projects that you've been involved with? Yeah, I mean, for, uh, first of all, I, I do have a nice pair of leather boots, but um, I promise I'm not stealing anything from <laughs> from, from jung jungle tombs to bring it back to my <laughs> colonial museums. But yeah, you know, there was there was a feeling in in when I was working at the time, so I worked at the R and D group in the Times, and we I worked primarily with a with a um, uh, statistician and also an artist named Mark Hansen, and he really got me to start asking questions about. I guess we can think of it as the provenance of data, like where 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 the data is coming from. I think it's pretty easy as a data scientist or like data put like put job after data, like data whatever you want to call yourself is, is that. Um, it's, it's easy to kind of have that data served to you on a plate. You know what your job is to do with that data, but it's actually kind of not in your job to interrogate the data too much. You know, you might want to know what the error ranges are in the numbers, or you might want to know if there was some big piece of the data that was supposed to be there that's missing, but you're probably not asking much about like who collected that data, what were the decisions made about, about like why that data was collected and how. And so I started to get really interested in the moment of moment of data genesis, like the moment in which data is created. And uh, really as a way I thought to make my own practice better. Um, and, and so in 2013, <clears throat> by actually kind of sheer coincidence, I got an email um, that, that told me that I was, uh, um, awarded as a, a National Geographic Explorer. And I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a spam message. You know, National Geographic is pretty generous with their marketing. <laughs> and so I just thought it was like, you're an explorer too, like that kind of message. And it like took a couple of emails to be like, oh no, okay, this is actually a thing. Um, and, and so I ended up going to the National Geographic headquarters for their annual um, Explorer Symposium. And I met, uh, a scientist named doc, uh, Dr. Steve Boys, who who had been at the, right at the beginning of a, a long um, chunk of field work in in the Okavango Delta, which is in Botswana, and we just got to talking about what he was doing. Uh, and you know, there were real their job was really around collecting data, but you know, they, they 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 had pencils 
and pan and paper that was like they had waterproof paper and water and these and pencils and that's kind of what they were doing and so we got around the the very um maybe nuts and bolts discussions about data management like how how we could build a database that would support their work but then also data as a story and and the the necessity to sort of make it something that isn't only there to be used by scientists capital s by but but by teachers and students by conservationists by the generally curious by artists and so we we ended up building this big um system that that tried to do all of those things and and so that that really started off what I would think of as like that, what you described as data in the field, because you know, there was a moment, which I described right in the beginning of the book, um, where I was in the boat um, with my colleague, Shaw Selby, and, and uh, there was this three, three and a half ton hippo coming towards us in the water, and it was pulling this big bow wave, and everyone was shouting. It was like, we're right, like approaching this catastrophe. I was trying to figure out, we're in this very, very um, section of the river, um, which is named for for was colloquially colloquially named I can't even say that word. Anyways, it was named for maybe obvious reasons, Crocodile Alley, and and we were about to be thrown out of the boat into Crocodile Alley. There's this hippo, and I remember just like <laughs> thinking like maybe I took this data thing a little too far. <laughs> this, this is close <laughs> enough. Um, but though those, those experiences really informed my thinking and uh, in, in all kinds of ways. And, and there's, there's a few of them in the book that really are trying, to, trying on purpose to bring you to a place that you maybe don't necessarily bind with the word data. And, and, and that's a lot of what the book is trying to do. It's just kind of like pull and pull your brain apart in ways, in ways that you might not have expected so that you can think about what data is a little differently. Yeah. Excellent. There's a concept you introduce early in the in the book, and then kind of dismiss a little bit as maybe you know something we're not ready for, and that's the use of data as a verb. Uh, that yeah. also got me thinking, you know, even in my own field, which is focused primarily on cybersecurity, that you know just the word security in of itself dictates some sort of end state when really it's kind of constant motion. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you explain what you meant by you know that we should be treating data as a verb? Sure. In, you know, data, data as a word is such a, there's a whole chapter on, on the idea of data as a word and where it came from and the kinds of things it carries, in some cases from hundreds of years ago, still in our minds. Um, but if I think for a lot of people, data is inert, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a surprise maybe that, that we think about data mining, like it's something that you dig out of the earth and, and and it's you put it in a wheelbarrow and kind of deliver it into your database. And the idea of, of trying to verbify data to make it into something that carries action is to remind people that, that the act of collecting data, and of course, all the things that we use data for, they have, the, uh, they have an effect on people's lives, or at least they, they carry the capacity to have effect on somebody's lives. So the verb that we commonly use, collect, is a pretty innocent verb, right? <laughs> it's like... I don't know, when I close my eyes and think about collect, I think about like picking berries gently off of a bush. So when, when Facebook, who uses that word, I can't remember how many times, dozens of times in their user agreement, they kind of depend on the idea that we see it as something relatively harmless and that we see the data as something that is inert. And so the experiment with, with the verb was, okay, well, what, what if data was a verb? So what if, da if Facebook were data dataing me? <laughs> and, and what if you know, the NSA were, were dataing us? And, and to me, it became a useful thing to hold in my head um, because it asked me to, to really think about subjects and objects. So who's the subject of datification and who the object is of, of datification? Um, and it sounds a little absurd, but actually the, the words that are close to data already have that. So we, you know, we call data a record. Uh, and, and of course, record is a verb. Right? <laughs> and you can, you can also think of as a, a data as a measurement. And of course, like measure is a verb. Mm -hmm. So we, we have these things already. And actually, I don't think it's a huge stretch linguistically to, to ask people to use it as a verb, but it... it it's itchy or agitates our brain for a specific reason. And that is that we, 
we don't like we don't like it being being active. We like it being passive, and it fits fits better into the narratives we've constructed if it if it's a passive thing. And then maybe finally to wrap it up, uh, I, I hope that it allows some sort of imagination for people to understand how they might be dating things, right? So, so how you might turn that data around. And that that's a, a, a real core piece of the book is, um, first of all, how do we cl close the loop between the people who data was collected from and the ways that we use that data? Uh, people, people, I think, I, I say this in the beginning of the book as well, that like living in data sucks, right? So you're being extracted from all the time. And the people who are extracting data from most are often the people who aren't getting the benefit of that data. So there's the question of how do we close that loop? But then there's the other question, which is like, how do we swap roles and put, put individuals and communities on a side where, where they can be dataing um, to empower themselves and their, and, and, and their friends and their families? Excellent. Yeah, I know there's a couple of those threads I want to pull on some more for certain um, with a couple of other questions. You, you also mentioned in the book, you know, just to stick on this topic a little bit, that the decision to collect data uh, is a power, as is the decision not to collect it. Mm. I've expand on that concept a little bit, particularly around the data that doesn't get collected. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I think I think. It, a real shift for me when when I was starting to you, you work with data, and I should say that like I don't come from any kind of formal training in this, as I explained a little bit in the opening. Uh, when it, it was a real shift for me to to start looking at data, a data set that that was given to me, as much about what is there as as what isn't there, and for a while that was. A, a technical question more more than anything like hey what what might i be missing here <laughs> like that would make my job easier so after the times i founded a studio called the office for creative research and we were more or less an r d group for hire although that doesn't like completely describe what we were doing and so often we would get delivered a very large data set um, by one of our clients with the intent that we would kind of build something to help them understand it better and so I, we would always start with that question, like what what isn't here that that we would need? But then then that that question becomes something different, right? And and in the book, I write about um, reasons for neglect uh, and like re reasons why the data aren't there, rather. And and sometimes that reason is just neglect. It's like, oh well, I forgot to collect the data. But sometimes it's something more ominous, right? <laughs> that 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 we didn't want to collect that data because it. Um, it didn't reflect what we would like the data to, the story we would like the data to tell us. Um, we, we didn't collect that data because the people who the data was being collected from um, were of a certain demographic that, that we wanna amplify and we wanna marginalize another demographic. And we use the word marginalize a lot too, I think in, in, a, in a case that it becomes meaningless, but it, it, actually, data is one of those places where marginalization is actually just like a real functional thing. Like, if, if somebody isn't in the data set, they are in the data set's margins. And we don't commute. We don't compute on the margins, as you well know. We compute on what is in the data set. <laughs> what is in the data set? And and so if you know if this even the schema that you've built around your data set does not allow for a certain thing, then that thing is is marginalized. And so, how do we? How, how do we consider those things? And, you know, I sat down with a, in, in the first interview I did for the book. As soon as I found out I was writing it, I knew who I wanted to interview first. And that was my friend Mimi Onuoha, who, who has done this amazing project for a number of years called the Library of Missing Datasets, in which she's cataloging data that doesn't exist. And so if you go to the GitHub repository, it's just literally a list of things we don't have data for. And then in physical space, it manifests as these long but empty file cabinets of, or fi long folders of files that are empty. Um, and I think in that project is really evocative to me because it's a good reminder that, that while it is true that there are some data that we don't have be because it's too hard to collect, so Mimi's example for that is like international transfers of funds. Like it's just like it happens too fast through too many avenues to be able to really get a good look at. But then there are things that we don't have data for, which 
are there's a good reason we don't have that data <laughs> you know it and the the data side of the black lives matter movement for example was kind of born out of that 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 exact thing there was no data about um police violence not because it's impossible to collect data about police violence <laughs> but because the you know the powers that be didn't want that data to exist and so um that was a, this really incredible act, I think, and liberatory act of data collection, and which really was manual and it was low tech. It was like people with spreadsheets who would sift through local news reports and collate it such that there was a central database. And so that, you know, in that chapter, what I'm talking about missing data, uh, which, is which is called data stark matter, a term that was borrowed by the author, um, Simone Brown. The idea is to, is to open your, open people's eyes to like, to be critical in that way to say like, hey, what, what is missing? But then also to, to, to be, maybe find a little bit of hope in the idea that that is a, um, is a useful act is to, 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 fill, to fill some of those missing spaces. And you know, it's not as clear cut as that. And I think there are a lot of cases in, in which data shouldn't be collected for, for good reasons. Um, and, and to build those kind of thinking skills to be able to, 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 to see what those spaces are and to understand when they should be filled and when they shouldn't be filled, I think is something I'm still learning that hopefully people get from the book. Yeah, yeah that definitely resonated with me for certain. Um, you know, we obviously named our company and the, the podcast after the UDA decision loop. So we kind of try and bring everything back to action. And what resonated with me was that the decision not to collect could be based yeah. on a decision not to want to take certain actions, right? In which case you're not really going through some sort of decision loop. You're kind of almost operating unilaterally. Uh, so when we have these programs or we collect this data that we say it's for the betterment of the people or society or whatever it may be, and they're deliberate decisions not to collect the data, it seems like it's the, the, the decision not to collect is kind of a policy decision to support a particular action. That was kind of the uh, one thing that certainly stuck with me. Um, it, it seemed like a lot of your kind of own development, uh, and maybe I mis misread this in the book, but it seems like this, the change around data and adjacencies and missing adjacencies was driven by your work on the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. Uh, mm. is, is that a true statement? I mean, I was really uh, interested in the story. Hey, there's this great kind of David versus Goliath moment, uh, you know, where the yeah. New York City quants, financial quants think they have the best algorithm and you come and best them, uh, you know, as kind of a small studio guy. Uh, but then it, 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 it almost turns sad for me with regards to your recognition around, you know, you've been hired to build this model to, to map people onto the memorial based on these adjacencies. But then mm -hmm. we're struck by the fact that there were people for which no adjacencies existed and kind of what that said. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that project and, you know, am, am I right or wrong uh, yeah. in viewing that as kind of a turning point for your own perspective on data? Yeah, well, I think you're right. And one, one of the difficult parts for me in writing this book in general was that there is not a clear line between point A and point B in my understanding of these things. And, and as such, it felt um, somewhere between like insufficient and immoral to tell a, 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 line, a story that was a straight line. And so you, you know, for that project, some things came very quickly out of that and some realizations came very quickly out of it, but some of them came much, much later. And so it, it, it was a turning point, but maybe in the kind of slow way that a cruise ship turns and not in the, not in the like quick way that a dragonfly turns, you know, it was something um, that took a lot of, a lot of time to settle into. Um, but so, yeah, uh, so, so I don't know how familiar people are with the, with the memorial. So take a, I'll take a moment to describe what the, what the, the problem was. Um, so when the memorial was originally proposed, Central to the design was the was the idea that the names would not appear in a visual order. So most memorials you would go to are either indexed by alphabetically or by time. Um, and and it was key to the proposal that it did neither of those things. And there was a thematic reason for it, and that was to kind of underlie um, 
the fact that it made no sense, right? Like that, that these people were not chosen for, for any particular reason. They just happened to be in this place on this day. And I, I mean, I think, which I think is a powerful concept. Um, it was a concept that didn't sit well with the first responders. And so the first responders refused um, that original concept for reasons that I can't understand. Those are people who were there for a specific reason. They went, uh, they went there voluntarily. So the memorial is broken into those pieces. But for the rest of them, the rest of the people, um, they're arranged from what on the outset looks pretty random, but it isn't random. And the, they're first of all, they're grouped by their companies and within large companies, they're grouped by like their, the people that they would have normally worked with. But the, the Memorial Foundation went through a very long process of asking uh, the next of kin of people if there were any, there was anybody they worked with who, who they had a, a, um, a, a meaningful relationship with, and if so, they they tried their best to put them beside each other on the memorial. So there were a lot of siblings um, who worked together and died together in the building. Um, obviously, people who had friendships at work, and it's it, it's a uh, it's a very emotional thing, and. I think that the idea behind it, I, I'm not trying to criticize the idea behind it, but what I've realized over the years is that that data set that I was delivered, that I worked on, which is the connections between these people, is affected by the same kind of social and political constraints that a lot of data sets are. Um, some of those people were undocumented immigrants, uh, and as such, it's pretty hard to find a connection to their parents or to their family or friends. And so in many cases, they weren't asked the same question as other people were. Um, social structures are different inside of a workplace for the, pers the, for the people, the person that's the CEO, CEO than it is for the person who's doing the janitorial work. And like all of that is, 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 is mirrored in that data. And, um, you know, I, I talk in the, in, the, in the book about one particular story about a young man who was a police cadet who, who went to the scene uh, and died on the scene, but is not included with the first responders. And um, the reason for that is because he was a, a Muslim man who for the weeks following the disaster was a person of suspect. And, and so, <clears throat> There's a huge amount of politics in that underneath that particular name and where it should sit in, in the memorial. Um, and, and for me, you, you, I, I also just can't help but think of, of all the other people who suffered as an outcome of that event and, and how their names are not there. And in some cases, how, how those, those people's names are just not known at all. And, um, yeah, it did. It, you know, to answer your first question, it did. It did really, really change the way that I think about how data is used and collected. Because I don't think there was any any ill will in the way that that memorial came to form. But it just is what it is, and that is, it's it, we, data is you know objectivity is we can chase objectivity for the rest of our lives and never get to it, and 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 that memorial is is much a a structure of data as it is a structure of politics. And, and I think if we can recognize that no matter what your data set is, that your data set is that as well, <laughs> then, then I think we do a better job. We do a better job of the thing we were hired to do, but we also do a better job as humans to, to, to try to be more inclusive and f more fair and, and, um, we maybe have gotten a pass, I think, as data professionals, or because because of our ability to cling so tightly to objectivity, we can be like, well, well, well I'm just like, I'm just following the numbers, right? Well, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that that's that's possible, and I think something that drove me, in some ways, away from data visualization was that kind of almost religious. Um, necessity to, yeah, I call it like the clean white bone of truth in the book, like that, that, that 
the, that, that, that should be the only goal in the way that we're telling data, the stories of data. But if you take anything out of this book, I hope it is that data is a messy thing and, and that um, that mess can, can be beautiful, but it also can cause all kinds of trouble for all kinds of people. And, and, and it, it, sometimes that trouble is an, is an inconvenience. And for people who look like you and I, it's often an inconvenience, but for people who don't look like you and I, and who live in places and in situations that are not like ours, it's more often harm. And, and it's kind of, we, we owe it, I think, as people who have benefited greatly from, from the industries that have grown up around data to do the work to make those structures better. It was a, it was a compelling story. I had, I had to pause reading the book. Like I mentioned, it, it, kinda, it brings this kind of sense of sorrow around the lack mm. of adjacencies. Uh, for this law enforcement cadet. Uh, mm. And then also the realization that, I mean, kind of that's etched in stone, right? Um, it's going to be yeah. around for hundreds yeah. of years. But then also maybe that serves as a marker, right? It's kind of a marker, a point in time and, you know, transition in our thinking about how to do better. Uh, so at least gives us something to compare to uh, as we move forward. Um, I want to switch gears uh, yeah. a little bit and talk about, um, you know, this, the sense of data around our personal lives. You know, years ago, I wrote this quick little blog post that was entitled, You Are Big Data and So Am I. Uh, and I was almost excited for the fact that this data was being collected about us, but not from the perspective of it being used by these third parties to deliver me better book recommendations. Uh, I was envisioning a, a time in which we might achieve some level of digital self-sovereignty over our data and be able to use it to improve our lives. Uh, it seems to definitely be a thematic around that in the book. So can you can you speak to this concept of how do we obtain a better control over the data about us, you know, and yeah. the decisions that we're able to derive from it? Yeah, I mean that's a, it's such a it's such a hard question. And in fact, when I got to the middle a point of the book, I realized that there was an imbalance there that I was going to have a hard time filling, which was that I was sort of setting this. The, the book is, is built in two parts. And the, the first part is, um, is meant to be a primer for people about what data is, how are we using it, and kind of what ways are it, is it affecting our lives. And then the second part of it is meant to be a little more hopeful. It's supposed to be this kind of thinking and examples about how we might write a new story for data. And I realized kind of in the midst, it took me about three years to write the book. And I took it in the middle of it that I didn't have enough on that second side. <laughs> it was like, there were, there just wasn't, a, there were, I couldn't find it a lot of really good, really good answers. And I think you know, putting data to work for individuals has proven to be harder than I think, you know, I, I would place myself in that same sort of optimistic camp. Um, you know, when I was at the New York Times in, in 2011, we, we were building, trying to think about what tools would be looked like. We built this tool called Open Paths that allowed people to co collect their own location data. And the idea was that you could then broker like a, a trusted exchange with researchers so that they could use your data. And we were, we were pretty hopeful about that stuff, but and, and the idea was that we would prototype it and then like lots of other tools would come out that would let you do the same thing, but they just never did, you know? The people, we st I still get emails from people who are like, oh man, I miss OpenPass because there they're, they're still kind of isn't anything like it anymore. And, and part of that reason I think is that, um, yeah, there's this no economy to support it. And, and, and so that makes any idea of, of how, do, how do you make your personal data work for you to be, to be pretty challenging. And I think there's been lots of suggestions and lots of plans. And, and, and so people, you know, we've heard that term data locker, you know, for years, the idea there was this idea that you would have a personal data locker and that similar to our open path project, you would be able to decide like how to sell it to who. Um, but why would why would anyone participate in that when they can just take it anyways? <laughs> you know, that, mm -hmm. That's like the challenge there, right? Is that there the, the, it, it relied on a certain amount of goodwill, which never existed. That that there would there would be that kind of um, that kind of desire to do something in a, in a way that was 
more fair to individuals. And so, um, you know, where I found some hope was, was, so I actually traveled to New Zealand because I read a little bit about the um, indigenous data sovereignty movement. And in particular about that movement as it manifested in New Zealand with an organization called Tamana Roranga. Um, and, and there the sovereignty issue, and, and to me a little, a little like hint, a little switch clicked in that, in that I think so too much of our focus was about individual data rights and not enough of it was focused on like rights as a, as a community or as a risk group or as a nation or whatever that is. And so um, what, what the, um, the Tamana Roranga people did have done an amazingly good job at is to sort of build out what, um, what a framework looks like for sort of realistic data sovereignty. Um, and I should should be very clear that this is all like deeply anchored in the Maori worldview, and it's a project that's run by 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 the Maori and and is is so, so for example when they started out on that project, the elders were very clear that they wanted the whole project to be all the documentation, all the planning, and everything to be written in Maori, and that sort of sort of forced a condition for people to. Um, find def new definitions for words. But anyways, at the, at the root of it, I think are some interesting ideas about what, what sovereignty of, of data could look like and how um, data projects might manifest that, are, that aren't top down and, and instead are, are bottom up. But what they, what they are, have found that a challenge with and which you know, is still a really a huge continuing challenge in my mind is what, what the technologies look like that facilitate that type of, um, <clears throat> that type of, of an effort. And then, yeah, how do we face this kind of problem, which is like burns with the blazing heat of a thousand suns, which is that the computational power that is required to do these types of things is in the hands of like yeah. four people. <laughs> and, and so it's like, you know, we, we have a hard, there's a hard job in front of us. Um, we've, we've really, I, was, I, I had a talk with my friend Kate Crawford, whose book um, Atlas of AI does a really amazing job at like outlining the scale of these computational systems and kind of how they came to be and how they rely on all kinds of things from changes in labor laws to, to you know, cobalt mining and lithium salt plains and all that stuff, which really does a great job of, of, <laughs> of picturing the task in front of us. Um, and, and so the, the, you know, the, the, the one line Kind of takeaway of the book is that um, we can't imagine a better future. We, we can't get to a better future for data unless we can imagine it. And so mm -hmm. part of what I'm trying to get people to do is like think about what something looks like without getting too overwhelmed by the fact that it's going to be really hard to get there. Yeah, yeah I wrote that quote down. So, you know, re revisit that in a second with a, with a question. Uh, sure. But, you know, I was just getting ready to ask the, a follow up on that and, and you kind of mentioned it and that's around the kind of the computational aspect of this. And we we could obviously collect data about ourselves or right? I could trail off my browser history. I could download my, you know, the knowledge that Google has about me. Um, yeah. There are various sorts of things that I can do. I can't broker that data with these providers. You know, I can't transact with Amazon and say, okay, mm -hmm. you know, I'll let you give me book recommendations only, but not food recommendations or whatever it may be, because as you mentioned, we just kind of give that away. <clears throat> uh, there's no there's no consumer demand, right, for value from that data, besides the services that they offer, the recommendation engine. And the ultimate uh, irony is that the book you just mentioned was actually recommended to me by Amazon. So it's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. the system works. Yeah. <clears throat> but what I can't do with that data is compute on it for my own benefit. You know, I can't, there's, yeah. there's no engine that extracts that says, in the past three years, you know, on the way home from a lunch, Matt stopped at 7-Eleven and bought Pepto-Bismol. Maybe there's an underlying low-grade food allergy or, you know, just a kind yeah. of over obvious example. So do you think that that's kind of the big barrier moving forward is that we just don't have the, the computational power for us to be able to extract value from that data? Uh <laughs> yeah, well, you know, some part of me wonders if that if if we again we're like playing into a narrative that's convenient 
which is that value can only come through like large scale computation and large scales of data because of course it value comes from very small sure. pieces of data as well. Um, when the when the pandemic started, I was kind of inundated with invitations to to take part in in these, I think pretty well meaning projects that would use machine learning and and big data to kind of help solve the pandemic. You know, mostly contact tracing projects, but things like it. None of them worked, and you know the the, the data efforts that did work. I'm thinking about the COVID tracking project. Uh, yeah. We're we're about spreadsheets, right? Like let's get some data and put it in a spreadsheet. And in my neighborhood, the, the, the data project that worked was a mutual aid organization called Waterfront Mutual, mutual Aid, um, which was again, a spreadsheet. It was like a spreadsheet of like who needed help and where were they? And, and then if I were like a meaning, a well-meaning volunteer, I could look at that spreadsheet and say, oh, I'm close to that person. Like I'm gonna go and, and, and help them. Sure. So, so, you know, that, that's like action at a scale of computation that we could totally 100% do. And then, you know, for, I guess, I, I have, I, again, I struggle to find good examples, but um, so, so just, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big bird watcher. And um, just yesterday, uh, the Cornell, Cornell Laboratories released an upgrade of, a, of an app they have called Merlin, which helps to people to identify birds. And now it has um, audio recognition. You can record sounds from birds in real time and it'll tell you what birds are there. That's a huge computational system that is not owned by, you know, it's owned by a university, which I don't know if you've heard this, but universities are like <laughs> civic structures that are meant to do exactly that. You know, they are they are meant to 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 be places where knowledge is concentrated, expertise is concentrated, with the intent to benefit us. You know, you know, Reagan in this country and Mulroney in Canada kind of rewrote that by saying that oh, you know, universities should be engines of of income for the country, but that's not actually what they're for. <laughs> they're, they're, they're there to, to serve that role. So, so I get I got a hope from that project. You know, iNaturalist is another university run project. Um, you know, their, their trained data set is one of the most astounding, astoundingly complex systems. Like I, I, I'm gonna make up the, the times, but in, in, the, in the dollar amount, but it, you know, it costs somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million dollars in two weeks to train every time they train it. And that's subsidized by the university and by the city. And so we do see places where, where, where this, this, these types of very high scale computation is, is being done in the service of, uh, of, of people. And in this case, wildlife uh, and science. But it, so it is imaginable. It is imaginable for us to find, to, to, to get to those places, but that's not necessarily what, you know, for the everyday, that's a great takeaway that I want for like people like you and I to come out with this is like, hey, this is, this is actually possible. Um, but for the average person, it's more like, how, how do I put data to this in, in service of my own well being or my community in the sense of, in the, in, for belonging? And some of these things are much, 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 much more simple. You know, I talk in the book about this project um, that, that came out of Birmingham called um, Of All the People uh, in All the World, which is also referred to as the Rice Project. And it's this astounding um, project by an experimental theater group where they take a huge quantity of rice and then count it out to represent different numbers. And it occurs in a public space. And it's actually just like a massive data literacy effort, like found with this amazing sort of shared storytelling and scene setting. And uh, I think it's very important, those types of endeavors, and they're very low tech. I think yeah. Yeah, I want to underline this, that it's a convenient narrative for the people who hold the power in data, that the only way to get use out of it is to use their infrastructures. Hmm. That is not the case. You don't need, you don't need a, uh, um, you know, a huge server farm to get value out of your data, nor do you need a JavaScript library to be able to tell a good data story. You, you can do both of those things without, without those tools. So maybe the answer is to, to introduce less complexity to some of these data self-sovereignty problems that we're trying to solve. Yeah, I, I would say like um, stretch, stretch your, your your horizon of complexity, right? <laughs> and yeah. like, because I think some things do need do need complexity, but many many of them, 
most of them do not. And you know, we're we're kind of at we're at a repeated stage. And my father, who's been in this this business of of IT for decades and decades and decades, always talks about this that we just go through cycles of hope where we think whatever the newest technology is going to solve these intractable problems we've already we've always had. And it is true that that like these new technologies do solve some things, but you know, we're we're in that right now where it's like okay, let's throw machine learning at everything, and hope <laughs> and hope that it's going to get us like. Uh, somewhere, but as individ you know, as individuals, as families and neighborhoods, there are m many other ways that we can put data to work for us that don't require those types of scales. That makes sense. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of the impact that data can have on decision making. You, you talk in the book about. Uh, our perception that data is passive and that's maybe one mm -hmm. of the most dangerous properties that it has. Um, so we take that in the context of someone, you know, might be watching this that is in a decision-making capacity. How do they address, you know, I'll call it kind of some of the risks of the data that they're using. Do they need the equivalent of kind of data yeah. red teams to help guide these problems or introducing kind of contrarian views yeah. or asking these tough questions? What action should they be taking, you know, if they're yeah. inspired to try and resolve some of these issues in their organization? Well, I think, you know, the first, the first thing that you said is, well, I don't know if you said it directly, but even to be able to ask that question, like what, what risks to people, what kind of po possible harms are, can I envision of this thing that I'm about to do? And, uh, it is impossible to envision these futures that that other people will, re will reside in. You know, it's easy to, to envision my own future, um, but not so easy to kind of envision the futures of other people. Um, so yes, I do think you need other people telling you what these risks should be. And I think it's important that those other people don't look like you. <laughs> that. Uh, a huge part of the mess we've gotten in is because these systems have be been built by people whose like imaginary futures are very narrow. And, and so when you're thinking about, okay, we're gonna start collecting this data, we're gonna put it to this type of use, like what kind of risks could happen? Um, first of all, yeah, we need to broaden our, again, let's use that same analogy. We need to stretch your horizon of like who, who, who that those risk groups are um, and not just the, like your own personal risk. Um, I read in the book about, about a humanitarian data project that was run by my friend Nathaniel Raymond um, where they were using satellite data to try to predict um, genocide, genocidal acts. Uh, and it was a hugely successful project until they realized that they could not comfortably and, and accurately assess the risk to the people on the ground of the things that they were doing. Because they couldn't assess that risk, they decided to stop doing it. And that's a very hard thing for people in our business to do, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, right? And, and, and so what they did is they kind of backed up and spent three years developing this thing called the signal code, which is for humanitarian um, institutions that are using data. And it's a set of codes and rules that should be answerable and followable before anything, any plans start getting made. Uh, and we need something like that. And so in, it, we, we st we've we seen the starting of this. There's um, you know algorithmic risk assessments, um, algorithmic audits, uh, that that feel in some ways like oh god why do I have to fill out this checklist before I go do my thing? But sometimes those check those checklists are important. You, you know that to be able to say oh yeah wait <laughs> I didn't think about this and maybe we need to back up and think about it before we before we get moving. You know I I had the chance to go to the um, bottom of the Gulf of Mexico in it in the in the submersible that discovered the Titanic and at it. I've never, I've never been witness to something like this because I've never been to space 
before, but I think it's the closest thing. Like the, the rigor of the checklists that get involved before you get in that sub and they mm -hmm. drop it in the water. It's like hours of checklists. You know, let's test, test engine one, test engine one complete. Like, you know, everything, like everything, everything yeah. is double checked. And, and so, and the reason for that is because it's a very dangerous place that you're going and if something goes wrong, everyone's going to die. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's not necessarily the case when you're deploying a machine learning project, but, it, but there are real risks. And, and so the more clear we can be with those types of checklists, the better. Um, and then I'll, you know, double underline that if there are not people on your team who can see the risk to the people who, have, who are, who are gonna be at potential harm that you're just not gonna be able to do your job correctly. Sure. So if you're doing a, you know, if you're working on a hiring system and there's a potential that your hiring system is going to be uh, uh, introducing, you know, some type of bias towards women or towards LGBTQ plus people and those people are not on your team, you can't do your job. You can't do it. It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And And, and so you need to either bring those people into the room or, you know, bet, even better, put them on the team or, or in leadership. And, and, you know, these are things we've been saying all over and over again. And I think what, what, is, what has been a shift for me that, that kind of happened a long time ago was that you, you, these things aren't about, well, they are, they are about kind of fairness, but they're also about just doing a better job at, at building futures. Hmm. Like we, we, you have, we talked about before this interview, I think about our kids, right? Yeah. Like, we have kids. They're going to live in whatever data future it is that we create. And, and uh, I don't like the one we've created so far. And yeah. a lot of the decisions we've made have been made without a sort of feeling that this was going to be a long-term thing that people are going to need to reside in for generations. And the more we can get into that, sense of you know the book the book is called living in data for a reason and the the more we can think of ourselves in some ways more like architects that, that are building like homes <laughs> that you know, that are that are about well-being and are about safety the better yeah excellent as i have just a, two more questions and it kind of feeds directly into that uh you talk about you know one of the call to actions in the book is that those of us that live in data need to be better at imagining futures. So what what future would you imagine? Like if you kind of put that that hat yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, I try it, I guess, in the last chapter of the book is kind of a a, a, a look into, into what a future might look like. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a couple of post-it notes up um, when I was writing this and uh, one of them, said, if it's not fun, they won't read it. Because it's like conscious of the idea that a data book can be really dry. And I think our conversation has been quite serious. And I like, I want to first say to people who might be thinking about buying the book that there's a lot of fun parts in it, I think. Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of weird kind of funny, funny pieces. Um, and so when I, you know, when I think about a data future, I, I, I sort of, it's anchored in, in hope. Um, and I think, you know, when I, I can't think of a future without centering the climate crisis, because I think it's the thing we need to center more than anything else. Mm. And we need to keep part of our mind on this question of like, how do we stop it? Although I think that question is becomes less and less relevant. And we have to put the mo bigger part of our minds on how do we, um, how do we help each other survive it? And, and from a data perspective, um, you know, I, I want to encourage people to be able to better observe the world around them so that they can make decisions that are going to be good decisions for themselves and their families and their communities. And right, right now, we're, we're, you know, you and I in this room probably don't fit into this description, but the vast majority of people do their data blind. They, they can't see data. It's not available to them. If there's a concern about air quality or or that they're, the, you know, your neighborhood's getting too hot and that the elderly people in your neighborhood are, are really suffering. There's no good way for you to collect data to support that hypothesis. And so we need to um, be building tools for people to be able to do that. And I think the, the open data movement tried that in some way, but the open data movement ended up serving 
a different group of people than the ones I'm describing. They know sort of like entrepreneurs who wanted to build a startup around, around, I don't know, whatever that startup might be. And so we need to do a better job of like, of, well, yeah, of getting people to be able to, 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 to do beta, data better. And so my future really looks like that where maybe through the public library, you could come in and say, hey, I'm really concerned about the heat in my neighborhood because my elderly neighbors aren't able to go out of the house anymore and get their groceries. And they could say, okay, well, why don't you take one of these um, heat sensors and put out, you know, put a couple outside your building and come back in, you know, a couple months and we'll help you upload that data to this project that's looking at heat islands. And then once you've done that, we'll give you a print out of it that you can go to your council members with to talk about this problem. Like that, that you know, it, and I understand this feels utopian. I mean, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I have a slight license to be utopian. But another way it really doesn't, right? We're talking about like old people who can't go outside because it's too hot, which sure. is just gonna be like a reality of our world. And so the ways that we're, and I don't know what the solution there looks like, you know, I, I know what some of the solutions look like, plant more trees, you know, build, you know, build, build more buildings that have um, better shade opportunities, but we can't start doing those things unless we dissolve the power around data in such that it sort of flows into the streets and is a little bit more evenly distributed. Yeah. No, I love that. I love the call to action. You know, I'm grateful you wrote the book because I think even if you're a data scientist, as you mentioned, it kind of gives you this additional perspective. Um, I had I gave a keynote at a hacker conference a few years ago, and I closed by saying, for me, the greatest tragedy would be if the hacker ethos is ever only applied to cybersecurity uh, instead of looking at other problems in society. And I feel like this is kind of the data science, you know, perspective on that as well. Um, so I won't ask you your favorite tragically hip song, but I do want to ask you because I close every interview with a yeah. book recommendation. Uh, is there something that you're reading and that you would recommend or yeah, you know, a favorite book that you think that the audience should take a look at? Um, well, you know, I already gave you the recommendation for, um, with, for Kate's book, yeah. which, which, you know, so Kate and I, um, Kate and I, uh, Wrote, wrote our books literally in the same room for a lot of the time. So, so I think they speak well together in a way that's, I think, fairly unusual for, for two books to kind of sit so well together. But uh, I, read, I read mostly fiction, to be honest. And, you know, a book that I've been thinking about a lot these days is um, Anne Leckie's Provenance. Um, so Anne Leckie is a really spectacularly good sci-fi writer, although her books are um, political thrillers wrapped in sci-fi. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in provenance is is it I can't think of a more relevant cultural book to be reading right now it's about um, this society whose kind of whole political system and whole power system is built around um, artifacts that can be given like um, authenticity so it's it's like I'm simplifying in a way that's ridiculous but it's like yeah. imagine if like a whole society was built around NFTs, like these yeah. things that are like yeah. authentically, authentically like real. And so yeah. it's a, it's a wonderful book. And, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll sit in a lot of people's brains in just the right way. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for taking the time, uh, A, to participate in this session. I love the, love the conversation. And thanks for taking the time to write the book. I know that you are a very busy guy. And a lot of times, you know, this is, it's actually a gift, you know, to have a book like this come out. So I definitely appreciate it. And it's going to stay on the top 10 list. I can guarantee you that. Okay, I won't, won't expand it to 11. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're right. in June. So I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable giving it a slot. Get, you know, yeah, already. that's right. Yeah. Like it's not December. That's yeah, all right. It's not, yeah. not December. So, uh, so it's earned that or spot. So th thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, man. Likewise. Good to have, talk. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.